Hi, everyone. It's always great to be back at uh, Fifth Elephant. Um, so this year around, I'm going to be uh, talking about, uh, you know, this is a topic about scalability, truths, and uh, uh, serverless architectures. Um, so my talk really has three parts. Um, part one, I'm going to talk about some scalability myths and then talk about what might be the truths. Uh, part two, uh, I'll be talking about event-driven systems, uh, what kind of interesting applications we can build with event-driven systems, uh, what complexities come when it becomes stateful. And uh, in part three, uh, I'll introduce the concept of serverless computing, why it is an attractive proposition, and also take you through the design of a stateful serverless platform that we uh, built and open sourced at Flipkart. So hopefully through that journey, uh, I'm trying to lay out uh, you know, why it's harder to build stateful systems and, uh, and, and also the value proposition of using uh, serverless architectures for, for building these kind of systems. So that's, that's, that's what it is, and the project that I said I'll be talking about is called Flux, um, and I'll be sharing details about how you can find it and its use in, in, in Flipkart. So, so part one, uh, things that you hear, right? You say our platform is on the cloud and we scale seamlessly, right? Now, I have a bone to pick on this because this was told by the CTO of a, of a erstwhile competitor when we, uh, crashed and burned in 2014, the big billion days uh, at Flipkart. Uh, and and what, when somebody says this, for me, what it immediately means that there is no impact to performance, right? Or user perceived latencies, it means that it just remains the same and irrespective of whether you're serving uh, 5,000 requests per second or say 100,000 requests per second. And, and, and that's the kind of numbers that we faced at that point in time, right? So which means that in a matter of seconds or minutes, you're able to scale to these numbers with absolutely no degradation. Uh, no impact to data, so which means that everything that's written, which means every order place, every transaction that has happened is uh, committed, data is durable, and is consistent. And consistent because obviously as you scale out, so it means that you could be serving traffic from any of these nodes and still you still return a consistent response. Another one which you hear is we follow SOA and our services are distributed across you know, some arbitrary number of servers, right? So we say, like, service-oriented architecture is the holy grail, and, and you know, we can do uh, whatever we want to do. And what they mean very often is that our services are stateless, right? So which means that when you say elastic scale, you can just add a bunch of machines to a, to a web and just uh, expect that it will serve traffic and without compromising any of the things around data consistency, durability, latencies, or any, or any of that. What it also means is that workloads are almost identical and can be served by uniformly anywhere in, in the cluster, right? Uh, and our systems, I mean, the systems can keep up with growth in compute and, and memory. So if you know Moore's law and, and with that capacity doubling, it means that your services can just seamlessly scale and, and grow with that. Another often implied thing is that network bandwidth is not an issue inside a data center. And you, uh, I mean, if you were to ask anybody in a data center, what is the most scarce resource there? It's not storage, it's not compute, it's, it's bandwidth, right? And committing certain bandwidth to every single running process, in, in this case, seems to say that, look, that's not a problem. And there's no need for consensus, or, or there, is, there, is no, uh, there are no faulty processes at all, right? Now, what this means is, irrespective of whether you're running tens, hundreds, or thousands of, of machines, all of these qualities have to be true if, if what you're hearing fr from this is, is actually relevant. Some truths, right? The first one, uh, this was by Jonas Bonner, who's the CTO of Lightbend, and if you know Lightbend, uh, so Scala, Akka, kind of, you know, both platform runtimes and frameworks were built by these guys. So he says that there's no such thing as a stateless system. It's just someone else's problem. Right, so there's nothing like a stateless. I'm yet to see a, a you know a completely stateless service. Maybe in, in pockets, but mostly not. Or the other one, which is by Lamport himself, says that a distributed system is one where a failure anywhere in that machine can actually make your system completely unusable. So now relate this back to what we did before. So any of what they're saying there is mostly untrue and mostly marketing, right? 
So don't believe it even if I said that, look, we can scale seamlessly without, uh, because we are on a cloud and you know, uh, we can handle it. And along the way, what has happened with state management, and I'm now going to the, you know, the, mainly the topic, is we have moved and expectations around state management has also changed, right? So what was ACID 1.0, most, most of us know that, right? Uh, like uh, there were full transaction support, you could write across multiple tables, have it transactional, you had no, no data staleness because data was consistent, you were mostly talking to the same master that was handling both read and writes in a typical RDBMS scenario. Uh, there is strict ordering, so which means that there is no, there's no, you can always expect that uh, the data is always consistent, and then there's zero data loss. And from there now, systems have moved in what is called ACID 2.0, where essentially it means there's limited transaction support, right? They are eventually consistent. Arguably, some systems do provide, and I'll, we'll, we'll talk about that a bit, right? There is relaxed ordering, and, and there's high availability. And probably if you want uh, with scale, uh, ACID 1.0 kind of support, then probably from what I know, maybe there's only one system in the world that supports that, which is the Google Spanner, right? So even state management has moved from, from what we know and expect from these systems to, uh, to what it is today, and, and there are reasons why it, why it is so. So let's just take a look at, uh, in more concrete terms, what is state in, a, in, in systems that we you know, use every day. Let's look at a, an e-commerce system. A completely stateless system is one where there's no session, there is no login and no basket, and there is static content. Pretty much, I think, a completely unusable site in this current scheme of things, right? Imagine you go to a site and, and, and this is all that you get to see, right? What does that help you, right? If it is stateless, it enables caching of content, uh, but items can go out of stock, then there could be around data consistency issues. So eventually you then translate or trans, I mean, you move to a stateful system. And in e-commerce, what does that mean? That we maintain a session for you, you can, you're logged in and you can have a basket, and, and there can be dynamic content, which is personalized. And all of this means that it's entirely stateful. So today, if any of us were to go to, uh, you know, www.flipkart.com or, or any other good e-commerce site, every one of that is personalized and, and stateful. Though it may not just seem, but that, that's, that's reality, right? And what are the challenges with that, right? Availability takes a hit. Obviously, right, consistency, and we all know the cap theorem and stuff, right? So availability takes a hit. Share nothing is not feasible. There is problem of consensus when data gets replicated, right? Consensus is a separate topic by itself, so I'll just say that it is a problem. Um, and there is need for data durability and guaranteed execution, right? And you also move from probably fail fast to, to succeed at any cost, kind of a, a, a pattern for, for serving those, those transactions. Right? So, so if there's just one example of saying why even the simplest of use cases is actually a stateful system. Right? Now let's move on to saying that how does this look like in, in event-driven systems? Right? So uh, this is an event-driven system. What, what, what does that mean? Uh, okay. So, so moving on to... Um, when we, when we took this concept and we're thinking of building systems with it, uh, another concept that's been out there for a very long time is, is essentially a finite state machine, which is, it says that it is a, an abstract machine that can be exactly in, in any one state at any point in time, right? And in this example, I think the states are locked and unlocked, and the events can be whether somebody is pushing in a coin, somebody is, the coin is getting popped out, and, and, and so on, right? Now, this is the basic premise of of building uh, a stateful system, and uh, you know, I'll, I'll then walk you through how we use this. Now, a stateful event-driven architecture or a system is, is a workflow, right? So where there can be arbitrary number of tasks that execute sequentially or concurrently and are triggered by events, right? So in this example, you can see that there are two events which are executing essentially concurrently, which all of them being triggered by events, but finally then there is even a typical fork and join that, that we all know, and, and, and reaching to an end state. Now, what can be the source of these kind of events, right? They can be user actions, like let's say in a, in a warehouse, in a, 
in an e-commerce supply chain, an item being packed, and somebody saying this item is packed is, is an event, which is user triggered, right? Messages from a messaging middleware, right? You have, like in, in Flipkart or any other e-commerce site, you would see offers going live, and every time an offer goes live, that can emit a, an, an event which is propagated through the entire fabric, and there can be systems listening to it. So that can come from a middleware. Or, interestingly, it can even be a database change of, of uh, a state change of entities, right? Now, think of this. I would go to a step further and say that using this pattern, you can build the entire supply chain or fulfillment of, of an e-commerce site, like including Flipkart, just using these constructs, right? Where the first trigger is when you place an order and the order gets created in the database. Now, that can be a trigger for starting of the entire fulfillment process, right? So every one of them is a, is a trigger, and uh, so long as you're able to listen into such DB triggers, such user triggers, uh, you know, such messaging middleware triggers, then you have plenty of sources of data which can, you know, help you build uh, stateful systems. So what's Flux? I'm, uh, I'll just introduce it here. It's essentially an asynchronous distributed a uh, reliable state machine. An orchestrator that can be used to build stateful event-driven apps and workflows, right? I think that's quite a mouth mouthful, but just bear with me. Uh, it, it offers very simple primitives uh, and deployment dependencies, and it's used uh, as a hosted service uh, in Flipkart, and that's where you see that it is getting closer towards being a serverless uh, platform uh, at Flipkart and available even as standalone. And today we run, uh, use Flux for running a number of workflows, account, accounting, all of our document generation, right? All of our um, seller platform uh, event generation for, for sellers, right? Compliance and document generation, FinTech. And it's and just to give you a sense of scale, we run up to a million workflows on this hosted instance every single day. Right, that's the extent of uh, adoption that's there. And uh, it's mostly serverless, and I'll come to the part why it is mostly when we talk about the design of the system, uh, trying to relate with uh, serverless computing. And uh, like I said, it's, uh, it's open source. Another use case outside of Flipkart, uh, this was used by, this is actually a, a DAG, uh, a workflow realized on top of Flux, which is used for a doctor teleconsultation. Right, and every one of it, like essentially the client creating a booking, you create an appointment, you see that it triggers off a bunch of concurrent actions, which is creates a client notifications, send a, a doctor call is scheduled, and, and so on and so forth, and then that leads to uh, you know subsequent execution. In this case, just for legends, it means the green ones are all complete, and the you know the blue ones are yet to execute. Another example, this was for scheduling health checkups, again, in a domain outside of Flipkart, very similar orchestrated in the same way, right? So all of these are following the same primitives of being event-driven, stateful, uh, using a finite state machine. Okay, feature set, again, I'm not, this is not a talk on Flux, so I'll, I'll, I'll skip the ones which are not directly related to it being either serverless or stateful. So the ones in, which are in bold, which talks about state management, async, distributed processing, um, parallel processing, retriable errors. That's because in distributed system, things can fail, so you need to have a way to be able to retry and go back to my, what I mentioned about succeed at any cost, right? So you want to be able to succeed as much as possible. Uh, you can configure timeouts and errors. You can go back in the flow. Uh, you can, there is guarantee of at least once delivery, right? So in, eventually, in a truly eventually consistent system, this is the basic guarantee that you need to have of at least once delivery of any event in the system, right? Uh, item potency at workflow level. So the moment you have at least once guarantees, you cannot have uh, uh, saying that, you cannot have uh, uh, the receiving service not being item potent because you will probably get the same event twice, right? Metrics and auditing because now you're trying to run it at scale, you're trying to depend on it for the running your critical workflows. So what does that have, right? So all of these are essentially gets a lot more complicated when you're trying to offer it for something that's distributed, stateful, and running at scale. 
So first off, starting with observability, right? It, any, nobody wants to be flying in the blind. So it's not just from the customer standpoint, even from someone who's operating the infrastructure. You, you have a, like I was giving the example of, you're trying to build the entire supply chain fulfillment on top of this. So when a consumer calls and says, hey, what's happening to my order? Right, someone, someone in the system needs to be able to go and in, inspect the, the workflow and then say where, where it is. And think of it, right? Today we, we probably do 500,000 shipments every day, so it's like five shipments every second. So someone needs, you need to have a system that will help you go and reason about the flow. So this is an observability where you can uh, import a, a state machine ID and you will get details on, uh, you know, what are the execution state. It's not very clear, but you also get details on every single step that has executed every single state transition that has happened. And you can also go and see the payload that was there, or even, in fact, the event payload for every one of these executions, right? And, and also see which ones have errored, which ones have succeeded, and so on. And what you're seeing here is actually from, from a live flow. So now, from here, what this is like, some of you might argue, right, there are so many workflow systems, so many event-driven systems, so what is so different from, from uh, a regular workflow system to, to when you say that, hey, what is it when if it is serverless and, and stateful, right? So let's start with what's a serverless platform. The very simple primitives. So those of us who have worked with either uh, AWS Lambda or with uh, Azure Functions, this is exactly the first two are the, their method signatures, right? You have a function foo, where you get, a, uh, you get data to execute for the function foo, and you also get something about the execution environment or the context. This is pretty much it, and you can send back a, a, a response, and, and that's pretty much the signature of a, of a, you know, a serverless function. And you say that, hey, once you write this, we can, uh, you don't have to do any server management. We can flexibly scale it for you. There's automated high availability, and there's observability on top of this, right? Now, serverless, in my opinion, was not something that, that just in vogue today, right? Those of us who write uh, Hadoop MR jobs, right? Most of us write just our MR functions, and then somebody is operating that infrastructure for you. Right? They offer two primitives, and the beauty of it was just like a map and reduce function. And in serverless, it's just this, this single function which you, uh, you, you deploy. Right? Now, there are different use cases of this. Now, you would hear very often the use case about somebody uploading a video file. You want to do metadata processing, and then you want to go and publish it. Great. Works for uh, you know, this kind of a serverless, serverless uh, uh, platform, but what nobody's telling you in that is, how is state management done there? Like, is it okay if you, by the time you upload the function, you upload the file, and if there is a failure in processing, what happens to that? Are there retries? Can you have multiple, you know, steps in the whole processing? Serverless function, just at least from the signature itself, is not giving you that out of the box. Right? And also, nobody is telling, while well, there are examples of saying you can, you can host an entire website on top of uh, serverless functions, can you do it when you have latency-sensitive uh, websites you want to host on top of them? Right? Because serverless functions or serverless containers today still have a cold start problem. Right? Those of us who have worked probably with Lambda would know that. It, it has a cold start problem. I mean, there are a few seconds before a new instance in a container can, can boot up and host that function for you, right? And, and what people try to do as workarounds is try to keep that, that container alive by sending in a few fake requests, which is still not a very natural way of, of uh, using a truly serverless function platform, right? Now, however, to address this, all of these cloud providers, at least I know AWS has this, to, to enable orchestration, they define something called step functions, right? Which is essentially, I think it's fairly explanatory. We'd say there are multiple tasks. You can have retries, configure those retries. You can do parallel execution, so in which basically the lookup address and lookup phone can. You're saying that, look, these can execute concurrently, and uh, what is going to be the next state? So which is very much like you're trying to handcraft the DAG in, in saying what is possible. Now take this and each one of these, uh, let's say a lookup address or lookup phone are Lambda functions themselves that you can deploy on the platform and it will orchestrate for you. Now what this has essentially moved is from being arguably the Lambda being a totally stateless 
environment is moving slowly towards being a stateful environment. And you see the complexities of saying, hey, there are retries. Uh, you can have parallel, you know, you fork and joins, and so on. Now, the same, if in, in code it looks like this, like if you use Java, but it uh, doesn't matter. So, similar, you can do a fork and join. Now, in, in Flux, what we try to do is actually offer, trying to go back to the same serverless, you know, tenets and say, keep the primitives really simple. So, we have only two programming primitives in the entire platform. Right? You have a workflow annotation and you have a task annotation. So what you're seeing this as a running workflow is essentially code which is written this way and there is no DSL outside of it. Right? And the interesting part is what you're seeing here is a serial flow, but even if there are parallel folks and join like the doctor consultation example that I gave you, you still write it in code. So which means it's totally type safe, very intuitive when you, when you program to it. So, and, and not something which is you're constantly shifting between a DSL and, 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 and code, right? And through annotations, when you say you're saying, hey, uh, first off, it's versioned, you get a timeout, you can say it's, you have so many retries. There is guarantee that so many retries will happen irrespective of whether it's running on a single node or running on a cluster of machines, right? Now, uh, and from a deployment unit, so the way people, uh, on board to this, this is like writing your MR jobs and uploading uh, them into a Hadoop cluster. So you write your workflow definitions or your code, you package them as deployment units and you run it inside the Flux runtime. And each uh, one level of isolation that we do is each runtime runs as a, uh, is loaded by a separate class loader. So therefore there is at least that isolation that's available. Fault tolerance, right? So I was talking about at least once execution guarantee, so which means that the moment an event is received by the system, it's made durable. So which means that the, those transitions and events, all of them are durable and uh, can be uh, used for driving at least once guarantees. But now, now comes the complexity. Can we scale this truly across thousands of machines and have absolutely no uh, degradations? The, answer, the truth is no. Right? There are limitations to how much you can scale such stateful uh, systems which are data-driven and where you're essentially keeping track of all executions, right? So local retries, so which means that every retry, every failure is, is tried multiple times and, uh, and, and on the same, same node instance. But what happens if, let's say, the node that was executing your task were to die, right? So then you have a coordinator global redriver which... Uh, which actually picks up and runs these retries. And now this is where we have, again, the other problem of consensus that comes into place, right? So which means that across cluster, there is someone who is able to keep track of state and then also uh, run it very, I mean, reschedule the, the, the retries. And I'll, I'll come to specific tech choices that we made in order to, uh, you know, try to guarantee this, but that's as we move along. But as you see that it's getting more and more complex when it is moving from from being totally stateless to being stateful, distributed, uh, and event-driven. So observability, now this is again a live cluster state. So this view is more for the previous observability view that I gave is more for users of the platform where you want to reason about, hey, what happened to my executing workflow? Whereas this is for the guys who are operating the platform to see that what are the health of tasks that is executing now on the platform, right? So with this, we would know as to which tasks are failing and in what state uh, and, and so on, right? So this is a live view and so that we can alert on it. It also happens to be our ops console and, um, you know, for, for, for observability. More observability, you get uh, metrics pushed out on all of the tasks that are running. Uh, and this, for those of us who are used to it, this is a Grafana dashboard, so which is uh, showing JMX metrics on saying every uh, workflow instance, type of instance, the type of task that is running, what is the success rate, what is the execution uh, rate, uh, the things that get sidelined. Now, sideline is a very interesting concept. In workflows, you would know that when you're trying to move from saying, hey, fail quickly, like in an online transaction when somebody is trying to see a web page, right? The best thing to do there is try to render it within a finite amount of time. Uh, with very low latency, or just fail the request. You're better off doing that than trying to completely execute at any cost. Versus with this kind of workflow systems, you cannot say that, hey, I tried to ship the item to you, sorry, we failed. 
right? It can be because of transient failures. In that case, even after the retries happen, all of those events get sidelined, which means somebody can go inspect the workflow, look at the failures, correct the source state, and replay them. So that's sidelining and being able to unsideline that. So uh, it also gives you a view into uh, you know, whether they are what, what is sidelined or what is unsidelined. So moving slightly to the design of such a system, right? If you're trying to build this, what do you, where do you start? Obviously, you start out with an API modeling layer. So we decided between DAG versus code, we decided on code. We said runtime, yes, it has to be local, distributed. So just so that you know, Flux can be run on a single laptop. All you need is a JVM and a MySQL instance, nothing more. And the same can run across a clusters of tens of machines. Again, totally transparently, right? Integration, which metric support, which you saw, UI for visualization, doing admin tasks, and, and deployment as well. And essentially, it offers like three modes. One is, like I said, local JVM, so you can do all of your development locally. And once you build it, then give it to the someone who's hosting the service, and they can just transparently run it for you, similar to what you would do with an MR job. And there's another one, which is completely isolated, where if you want to really have teams which bring their own compute, and how do you integrate, right? On tech choices, uh, execution isolation, like most frameworks spin up a complete new process, like a JVM, uh, like as Gaban does it, I'm sure a bunch of them do that. But what we did was we said, hey, uh, we do separate JVM, but we also support thread bulk heading, so which means compute is isolated within the same JVM. We also do deployment units, so at least code level there is separation, right? Execution runtime, we can use uh, JVM with coordination, let's say with Zookeeper, for example, or let's say using Akka cluster, and we chose Akka cluster for a number of benefits. Uh, state data store, uh, we want highly consistent, so it was a choice between MySQL and HBase. To keep it simple, we still go with MySQL, but which is heavily sharded and you know, uh, can still scale. Retries, again, Akka offers excellent supervisor hierarchy and retries, we use that. And we also have a cluster-wide scheduler, which I was talking about, the redriver, right? And that redriver instead of, and it also requires coordination. So instead of using something like uh, Zookeeper, we actually use the Akka's uh, gossip protocol to find the cluster-wide singleton of this uh, scheduler, right? Node placement coordination, again, uh, using the gossip protocol. Deployment unit, so between uh, you know, Java module system and say Juice and, and separate class loader, we actually chose the first, which is Juice and separate class loader. Metrics, so we do JMX, Hysterix, matrix time series, so all of that uh, is integrated. And timeouts and failure detection is using Hysterix, right? So all of these are various choices to guarantee each one of those requirements that I was uh, talking about. Uh, yeah, so this is just a view of what the entire container looks like, uh, where we use, it's basically it's a JVM-based platform, um, using Juice, uh, JT for uh, API, all of the HTTP console. But again, all this again runs in a, in a laptop. You can bring it up in, like in under five seconds, it'll, it'll just boot up on your system, right? And the same will, will translate to when it runs in production as well. So a slightly more scale, you know, zoomed out view, like you would have Flux client submitting to an ELB, or it could be any VIP, sending the events, and you have the various Flux nodes that are running, and each then emitting those events. Like if you, if you notice those tasks that the primitives, that it can, the only thing a task can do is emit an event, right? And there can be other tasks which are subscribing to the event, and, and so on, and that's how the entire DAG gets built. So all the examples that you saw there, it's using only these two primitives and nothing more. There's no configuration, there's no, no code outside of what, what you see there, right? But uh, this is how they, it gets orchestrated. And from here, it can get more complex where you say someone says, hey, I want to bring my task and I want to bring my own compute into the mix, saying that you do the whole state management, but I want my jobs to run in a very contained uh, cluster so that what can happen is I, I get dedicated compute. And we have such models as well. So this, this is the third option of deployment that I was uh, you know, talking about, right? So with this, I think I'm towards the end of it. What I'm hoping is that this gives you a sense of what it takes to say that first of all, there's no truly stateless system. And if it is stateful, it just becomes a lot more complex. And stateful event-driven makes it very interesting to create very rich applications, stateful applications across domains that you can build, and while there are public platforms that are available and you should obviously use them, 
what it takes to design uh, a private or on-premise system and, and, and it actually build it out using the same concepts. So a couple of additional readings. So if someone says you want a truly stateful, uh, highly scalable system, go read this white paper on the Microsoft Service Fabric. Very interesting read. So even in fact, I read that even the Cosmos DB uh, runs on top of the Microsoft Service uh, Fabric. And you'll, you'll see, you'll be able to relate to a lot of points that I made about consensus, leader election, protocols, and so on. How all of that is baked right into the platform. This is one uh, good white paper. The other one is, not while it's not directly related to Stateful, this is a great paper by Jeff Dean and others from Google who spoke about how do you build latency uh, tail tolerance systems, right? What do, you, what do you do if you don't want even the last, I was talking about fail fast, what if you want the fail fast to occur for lesser and lesser number of users? Because there will be tail latencies, there will be systems that will break, and if you, if you go back to the cluster that view that I was showing, in Flipkart it's a reality even today that at any point in time, something across the our hundreds of thousands of VMs is failing, right? So how do you still build resilience when you have such faulty systems. So this is another great uh, read that, that you can you know, go through. With that, I'm, uh, I'm done. I think probably have some time for questions. We can take uh, three questions. So. There is uh, one gentleman there behind. Just raise your hands, the volunteers will come to you. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, my question is, it's an event-driven. So it works very fine when we have an MHE in place. But whether this will work in the DC, where we have only manual or the manual operating uh, operations are happening. And second question to uh, that, uh, let's say if the, my DC has order of retail or uh, store orders, so how this event uh, event state will help? Okay, I, I'll try to paraphrase what you said. I think the first thing is, is how do you bring in human-driven events, right? Manual yeah, so manual process. So if you have a manual process, obviously this is about a system. So this cannot replace the video that you saw there. So assuming that were to be modeled as a system, right? But every action where to trigger an, an event that, is, that can be captured in the system, then you can orchestrate the entire flow with that. Okay, so, so in the example that I was saying, in Flipkart, if you see in a warehouse, there are a lot of actions which are manual. So which means that somebody is going and picking an item and he gets an order to be shipped and he's going and putting it into the box, right? At the end of it, he's required to say that, hey, the item is now dropped in the box. Now that is the trigger for the system. That's the systemizing part of that manual activity. So it still has to generate events on the system, right? The second one, the second one? Retail orders and store orders. Uh, retail orders and store or store orders, how this event uh, will help? This I, event. I, I'm sorry, I didn't get that retail. Retail or store orders, we generally in the outbound, we have to consolidate all the orders and at the end of the day, we will have an event to trigger to, uh, sell out, uh, move out of the warehouse and give it to the store or retail sure. customer. Can we take this offline? I think this is very e-commerce specific, so can we just take that offline? Sure. Yes. Yeah, just to interest of time. Uh, hey. So how do you guys um, handle cases where you need transactional semantics? Uh, how do you guys handle cases where you need uh, transactional semantics? We need transaction semantics. Yeah. Okay. So here, so every so that what executes inside the task is is user code, right? So the transaction semantics for that is guaranteed by the task, and and the person who is writing the task. We don't offer anything from the platform itself. What where we offer transaction semantics is for all the state management that is done by the system. So which means that if so there can be a case, uh, good point, let's say somebody, uh, the, the fact that the task is executing is in a separate transaction, right, while the entire state management is another transaction. We don't try to cut across transactions, right, because he could be even writing it to a JMS queue, and there's no way without distributed transactions you can make this work. So what we track is transactions as seen by the platform, so which means that 
let's say we have we have logged that the event has occurred. We we call the task and let's say it were to time out, but it has gone ahead and completing the transaction. That's treated as a failure and a retry would occur. And which is why I was saying that all the tasks in that have to be item potent. So there's there's no rollback as far as so the the fact that an event occurred is there is it, it's immutable, right? So we only guarantee that. Now beyond that, if a task has has occurred and if they, they have completed the transaction, but we the system doesn't know that it is completed, right? So when a retry happens, that item potency check has to take care of saying that hey, this has happened and move on with it. So there's no distributed transaction if that's what you are trying to, right? We don't. And it, like, see, XA is super expensive. You'll have to probably make it work on a single platform, and we can't guarantee that if you're like trying to have each of the tasks possibly talking to a number of data stores or doing. Uh, you know, even network calls and so on. Uh, sorry. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't wait. Excuse me, uh, can you please take that off and we have one more question. Sure. Uh, uh, so, uh, in this event-driven system, right, based on your experience, uh, what would be your recommendation uh, of the influence of a payload in, in an event? Like, uh, with, re with relation to the performance of the whole event, what is your recommendation in terms of the size of the event and the payload? Good point, good point. So we, obviously if somebody is trying to send an entire video image through, through the event, we would not allow that. So we have a strong onboarding process. And uh, in fact, we have a number of workflows in, in Flipkart too, which are like sending a million emails to customers. We say that, look, that's not a case for this platform at all, right? So there is very clear call out on saying, when you're trying to take the example of a, a video image, the better example would be to store it somewhere on, we have a blob store, and then use the, send the reference th through the, yeah, you would have a, a reference to that entity and then pass that through the, through the flow. And we have clear onboarding uh, guidelines on what can onboard, and many a time we have actually refused onboarding systems because they don't have a natural fit. Uh, in interest of time, request yeah. the participants. Thank to you. Take the questions offline with Thank you.